the Edgeless Swordsman here. It's October the 18th, 2022. I haven't done a video in a while. Uh, one reason is uh, that I've been a bit sick, and the second reason is that, well, for a couple of weeks there, uh, silver and the metals and miners did pretty okay, so I didn't feel the need to uh, bring out another dose of copium. Uh, but since then, in the last yeah last week or two, uh, miners have turned down a bit, uh, especially the juniors. Not all. I mean, there there are some juniors too who are, you know, not even lower than their July lows. Uh, but some are lower. And the overall, I would say, I mean, the the sentiment sentiment is just getting worse and worse. Uh, feels like uh, everyone is pretty. Apathic almost. Uh, you can see that on, on Twitter, etc. There's like barely anyone talking about buying miners, especially gold and silver miners, uh, etc. So, I mean, that that's obviously a very good sign uh, that nobody uh, really is bullish. Nobody even dares to say they're bullish uh, because they, you know, feel like, well, uh, you know, uh, I guess a bit of an ego thing. <laughs> excuse me uh, that you know you look silly because the past performance has been so bad uh, and of course past performance has nothing to do really with future uh, performance uh, uh, except in an opposite way the worse the past the better the future the better the past the worse the future so they are related it's just not in the way that most people uh, view it because uh, the, the, it's like nowadays I mean uh, you see people talking about shorting miners uh, you see people talking about you know giving up on the sector etc uh, irony is of course that this uh, the, the, the lower they go the cheaper they get the, the better the future returns are uh, I mean that's just how it is you can look at any cyclical sector and you'll see the same patterns uh, commodity sectors especially they crash up to 90% and they can go up like a thousand percent and they crash 90% and up thousand uh, percent etc uh, and uh, it's like I, I've just done this uh, chart here of Bear Creek Mining, which is, uh, again, like I said before, a trading sardine. I don't own it, uh, but it's been around for a, uh, for many years and has a huge silver resource. Uh, so basically, you know, not too much has happened with the company. They've actually added, uh, I think, a producing asset, the Mercedes, Mercedes mine, and I don't think that's a high margin uh, mine so it pretty much uh, hikes up the beta I would say of Bear Creek mining even more because now they have production and probably not uh, high margin productions so you know could go up even more if uh, the sentiment and metals etc turn around uh, but you can just look here it's like I mean uh, I'm just gonna hammer home the fact that I mean, most people on Twitter all the time is like, I mean, right now, for example, there's a lot of finger pointing and a lot of people trying to tear down uh, other people, which is typical if, in a, you know, when sentiment is crap, etc. You know, make yourself look better by pointing out the mistakes of others or, or other people's returns or someone, you know, haha, you've been in this sector or whatever. I mean, it has nothing to do with people's actual returns. I mean, my returns doesn't change based on whatever anyone else does. If someone has had a stellar year and is up 200%, that doesn't change my portfolio. And if someone had had a terrible year, that doesn't change my portfolio either. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so, so it's just, uh, but it's very, very human thing to do, you know, get frustrated and, and try to point uh, fingers and basically, uh, well, put the focus on other people, uh, you know, look at that guy or uh, those people, they have, you know, they're doing w uh, even worse than me or, you know, stuff like that, misdirection, let's say. But, but if you just uh, look at this chart here of Bear Creek Mining. Uh, I mean, I, I've 
uh, charted some levels. You can see this red line here, for example. I mean, th this is a level that uh, Bear Creek Mining has been able to get to uh, ever since 2006, pretty much. And of course, there's been some dilution, etc., etc. But it, of course, can also. I mean, this was the 2011 top. I mean, you can see how far that went. So they can obviously, when sentiment gets really good, uh, this sector or Bear Creek Mining could overshoot this level by a mile. But but just to make a point, it's like okay, it has at least reached this level every time. You know, every uh, I don't know, two, three, four years or so. Okay, just looking at that, and again, it's like a trading sardine, it's like a ping pong ball. Here the sector is expensive, and the sector is hot, and down here, the, I mean, this is global financial crisis, nobody wanted to buy miners, nobody wanted to buy miners here, nobody wants to buy miners now. But if we just look at the actual, you know, uh, charted returns here, so it's like any time you bought Bear Creek Mining here, uh, you got at least a hundred hundred percent return historically uh, within let's say two years and a, and a double in two years is really good uh, what that uh, by extension means is that if this was a good buy every buy lower got increasingly better and if you bought here that didn't and it went lower that didn't change the fact that this would this buy here would come to return 100% even though it would first go down uh, 71% so again it's like when people say this sector is so hard which is kind of is because it's so volatile but but at the same time the the, the predictive ability of human emotions psychology meaning that we know markets will always go up and always go down means that what has gone up will always come down and what has gone down will always go up you know not company specific i mean bear creek mining could go uh, uh could go bankrupt but the whole sector is not the, the sector is not going away so you know on average uh, the average miner will go up and down forever up and down up and down up and down uh so we if we know that that makes it, I mean, it, it makes it, in one sense, so extremely easy to beat this sector. Because, I mean, when people say that, you know, wait for a bottom, you have to time, everybody, everybody and especially the ones who bought high, always at the low start to talking about, oh, uh, should become a better market timer or whatever. It's like, how much market timing did you need in Bear Creek Mining here? If, if you can be off by 70% from the bottom, over 70%, over like, you know, one and a half years, you could l look that wrong for that uh, long and you would still make uh, make money. So how, how much time do you need? You don't really need much time. You could miss the bottom by 50% or more and you would still do great. And of course, like, I, I, I mean, what makes it even simpler actually to beat the market is that, okay, if you knew that this on average would return 100% and it goes lower, <coughs> you already know what you should do. How do you get even better returns? I mean, if you just bought once and saw it go down 70% before it went up and you made 100%, that's good enough in itself but how do you without knowing how the market is gonna go without knowing that if this was a bottom or if this was a bottom or if this was a bottom or this was the start of a rally yada yada the only thing you can know by default as well in a cyclical sector is that the lower and cheaper a sector gets the better the buys so without even knowing if if let's say uh, this would be the bottom if the bottom was in here and you, you bought here without knowing that just knowing the fact that the lower they go the cheaper they get the more you're gonna make in the future it makes everything increasingly simple so i mean how do you again without predicting how the market is gonna go in the short medium term even 
just knowing that this sector and markets overall will always go up and down, always go up and down, especially uh, cyclical sectors. I mean, you just know by default that, you know, and you can see the, you know, percentage levels here and I've, you know, written, written them down here. I mean, it, it's just a default buy. It's, it's just a degree of how, how good the buys are. I mean, just looking at this chart, first thing you should notice is like, the lower you would be able to have bought Bear Creek Mining in the last, you know, since 2016, 2006, the, the higher your returns would be. But, but, I mean, this is the, well, this is actually lower. This was, uh, I think, uh, up to like 600% until the next sentiment high. This buy here wasn't as low, but sentiment got a lot better. And I think this buy here returned 3,000% or more uh, up to the top. So, I mean, it, it's this sector is easy because just based on common sense, it's easy. It's just that it's very hard to stick through it because, again, it's like if you bought high, if you started buying here, and it goes down and down and down. You, you're, you're looking increasingly stupid. You, you start to doubt yourself. Uh, and, and you think, I mean, we trick ourselves that the, the, the solution to have bought, bought high is to like, you know, sell low. Okay, yeah, yeah, did, this didn't work out. So I'll, I'll sell out here and, you know, look for something that works or whatever. I mean, you could, you could buy as many highs you want if you just keep on buying increasingly low. And of course, I mean, if you, add, if you bought here and you added 5% to your portfolio here, that's good. I mean, that jacks up your returns anyway. Or, or let's, say, let's say, take this for example. Uh, if, you started, uh, if you started buying here, I mean, that's not super great, you know, expected returns. <laughs> uh, but you added 5% here. That, I mean, that, that's going to help you out. Sure, you won't have, you know, really, really, really good returns maybe from this level. Uh, but I mean, compare that to putting in 5% extra here, for example. So, I mean, sure, I, I know people like, uh, you know, oh, it doesn't matter anymore i'm down so much so you know why should i put in more money it's like well because any additional buy the lower it goes and especially the later it goes uh, the the compounded the expected returns and compounding rates of those buys uh, go up exponentially one thousand dollars invested here has a lot higher compounding than here not only because uh, <coughs> future expected returns are higher, also because it will be closer to the next uptrend, because we know that no trend lasts forever. So every buy by default gets better the lower and later uh, you know, the, the sector goes, by default. Uh, and just to you know, show what I mean here, so since we know there are two certainties, uh, the mining sector is not going away and uh, sentiment always changes, uh, AK markets always go up and down. So without knowing anything other than that, just take those uh, as certainties. That, that's, let's say that's your only due diligence or investing th thesis. Knowing that means that, okay, you know that this downtrend will always end. You know that this downtrend will end. You know that this downtrend will end. You, we know that this downtrend will end. Okay, so knowing that, what happens, uh, especially when we go in late into a, uh, late and cheap into a downtrend, <laughs> we know that every buy gets better and better the later and lower it goes. Why? Because since we know the market is going to, uh, uh, will will forever go up and down, forever up and down. And le let's just say again, this is like you know the next uh, ex uh, expected uh, value at the next sentiment high. So what happens if you started buying here? If if you bought here, that was later and lower, 
later meaning it's closer to the next sentiment high and lower means the future expected returns go up. So what happens uh, not only again, not only does the future expected returns go exponential like you see here 200 percent, three, five, seven hundred percent. It's in a shorter time frame as well. So I mean compare compare these buys here. Why is this so much better than this? And why is selling so much worse uh, here than here? Uh, because it's later, meaning quicker payoff. It's lower, meaning higher payoff. So higher returns and quicker returns, which makes compounding go exponential. So not only does the return go exponential, but also the time to said returns go up. So it's actually... It's like, uh, it's like uh, an, uh, an exponential thing on an exponential thing, if you know what I mean. Uh, so uh, again, it's like there, there is nothing more expensive than buying low and late in a cyclical sector. Nothing. I mean, again, what is, what is the definition of a bottom? It's the last day of a downtrend and the lowest point in a downtrend. Those are the definitions. So, by definition, the lower a downtrend continue, uh, the longer and lower a downtrend continues. We know if if, if this sector goes down today, uh, that means that it has gone lower for longer than yesterday. So, by definition, we're getting closer to the next uptrend or the next top. We're getting one day closer to the bottom, which will be the lowest and latest point with the absolutely highest returns and in the quickest time frame. Because again, if, if you, if you, let's say, if you bought here versus here, the returns would be the same up to here, but this would be a quick return. The time frame is shorter from here to here than from here to here. So this is a better buy than this. Not because it's lower, but, but because it's later. So again, any additional day, especially when we're at these extremes. So this sector can bottom tomorrow in, in five months, in six months, a year. I have no idea. O the only thing we know that it will bottom. And the lower it goes, the more we will make when it turns and the, the longer it takes the quicker the closer we are to the actual bottom so again just knowing that common sense that by definition buying later and lower in a cyclical sector is exponentially better gets exponentially better uh, so when you think about that, that makes it, in my opinion, a lot easier to just buy, buy, and 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 buy. Because you already know that you're not making a mistake. You are not making a mistake. Sure, you can pick the you know wrong companies to say, I just, I'm not saying you should buy crap. But assuming it's not crap you're buying, the, the, the buys just get better and better and better and better. Because let's say uh, this uh, has not bottom and it goes like this before the actual bottom is in and it heads higher. So again, what is happening here? First of all, the cheaper it gets, the higher of uh, expected future returns. The longer it takes, meaning that uh, you know x amount, uh, this is x amounts of days in the future from today. That means we're getting closer and closer to this point as well. And this would be the absolute best buy in possibly like eight years or whatever. So it's just, without, we know that this point will come when the bottom is actually in. And we, know, we don't know when that is or at what level that is. We just know that as this goes lower for longer, we're getting increasingly close. So if this is you know, the 100% best buy, uh, as we get closer, we know that it's nearing that ultimate buy of the next eight years. And again, without even knowing when and at what level that is, by definition, 
simply how markets work, we know that without even caring about you know Fed hikes, uh, inflation rates, gold, silver, yada yada yada, we know that uh, the buys get better and better. They get more and more undervalued. I, again, it's like it's not only that they go lower. I mean. You, you can have uh, take uh, Tesla for example that can go down 50 percent and still be uh, you know very overvalued so there's a big difference because like Rick Rule said this sector the gold sector gold miners are the cheapest he's seen it in 39 years so we already know where we're uh, we're gonna on average make a lot of money on our buys it's just that uh, from here on out knowing that as they get more overvalued and this downtrend takes even a longer time it's just that the the quality the expected compounding on those buys just go up exponentially exponentially so th that's like i mean if just knowing that i mean there's no way anyone would sell and if there's no one way one would sell it's getting pretty impossible to lose money in this sector just knowing that If, if someone just increasingly bought the lower the sector went, never sold. I mean, it's kind of hard to not make money in that case. It's very hard, actually. And again, it's like, we have no idea. And another point is like, how, how, how could you have known that this was the bottom here? Why didn't it go down here? Or, or why did this one not go down here? Or why did this go lower than this? We have no idea. We just know that the point stands that the cheaper something goes and the longer it takes the closer we are to the inevitable bottom so if if one were let's say you know again trying to market time or waiting for the bottom etc so maybe th this point in time comes along and and somebody is not buying because they expect it to go down here it was already cheap here but you know if you never want to, you know, uh, uh, can't dare to have, you know, red in your portfolio, or whatever, you're a perfectionist or whatever, which is obviously not needed, which I've shown. You, you don't need, you can be off by 50 to 70 percent and you still make money in this sector. So let's say you don't buy here because you, you again, you're afraid that uh, it's going to go even lower. So, so you don't buy. Whereas the person that just knows those simple things that, okay, if I bought cheap, that's good enough. And the cheaper it goes and the longer it takes, the higher my returns are. Again, that would be, I mean, uh, <laughs> this buy would have made a good amount of money. This would have been an even better buy. Why? Because it uh, more time has passed. So there's a shorter time frame to the next sentiment high and high returns so high returns in a shorter time frame frame than here so again the lower you bought the better the buy the better the buy the better the buy the better buy so you would never allow yourself to sell out at uh, a low here because you would be increasingly buying because you know how a cyclical sector works so you bought all the way down here, whereas someone who was trying to market time, for example, he didn't buy here. Maybe he bought in here. Maybe he bought in here because, again, now he thought, uh, oh, this is probably the bottom. And then he immediately gets a big retrace, maybe, you know, gets stopped out or whatever, because he's not sure anymore that it was the bottom, etc. Uh, yeah, it's, again, it's just common sense. Markets go up and markets go down. Unless the mining sector is going away, this is going to turn up one day. And the only way we know that it's getting closer uh, is that it, uh, you know, goes a bit lower and takes a bit longer. Or, or maybe this is the bottom. I mean, who knows? I, I didn't predict this to be the bottom. I had no idea this would be the bottom. This looked like actually a, the start of another rally because, I mean, <laughs> why not? It reached the same level around the same level that it reached here. Why wouldn't this have been the bottom? So maybe you bought in here and then you, you know, you bought high and then you're going to end up selling low because you're looking for the, the bottom. 
It's like I can't afford to sell these lows. I can afford to buy these highs because I'm buying these lows. But I can't afford to buy high and then try to market time this. I can't afford to not be buying here because I expected it to go here. I can't not buy here because I expect there's a chance it will get even cheaper. <laughs> because there's no guarantee of that. Maybe it goes down tomorrow. Now I feel pretty happy about not having bought today. Uh, and the day after that, you know, the, the bottom is in. Who knows? All, all I know is that it's, it's certainly not buying high that kills people. It's that refusal to buy low. Because if you bought high, there's nothing better uh, than to fix the, that than increasingly buy low. And sure, I mean, it's, uh, you're not going to be, I mean, all, uh, well, I'm going to be all in from whenever the bottom is, uh, like I've been. I mean, I was all in from this move to this, from this to this, from this to this. I'm going to be all in uh, from this bottom as well. It's just not that I'm, I'm going to, you know, let's say my average return or uh, let's say I'm, I don't know, down let's say 50% or whatever, and let's say, uh, you know, I'm down 50%, so when it go goes up here, I might make, you know, I don't know, 200%, something like that. I mean, you again, you don't need perfection. It's like when I, I, I sent an email to Bob uh, asking him, uh, you know, uh, or saying some something along the line, so I don't remember how bad... Uh, how bad it felt during the 2015-16 bottom because there's a few I mean that's way back when now uh, and just you know ask him do, do you think I mean do you remember if this is worse or if 2015-16 was worse and and he said you know pretty much the same but important thing is if you get one of these bottoms right you can retire and that's the whole point um, if if uh, this market does like, um, uh, if the junior sector does like it has always done, meaning that after a fat crash, uh, it always goes up, I might be able to retire. Uh, and I don't know a, a sector that is more undervalued with higher future expected returns than the mining sector. So I'm just in increasingly buying. I, I, you know, I, I hope juniors go down even more today. Because again, I know that if I have dry powder today and put that in, that's going to be an even better buy than yesterday. Maybe maybe we're here right now, or or here, and uh, or yesterday, and today we're here, meaning a bit closer to the bottom, a bit higher returns. Great. <laughs> Excuse me. Just some other common sense things like this is the. US stock, uh, U.S. stock market, like the mining sector since 1939, uh, they go up, markets go up, but they have long periods where they go down a lot or, or stay down for a long time, I mean tens of years, that still doesn't change the fact that the, lo the, the lower the market went and the longer it took, uh, the more profitable the buys. That's just how it is. So, I mean, if you just had a, like a thing, because the stock market is not as volatile as the junior sector, obviously. But if you're like, well, I'm going to start buying quite heavily anytime the stock market is down 20%. And then I'm going to increasingly buy every percent lower it goes. So, let's say you started buying heavily here, which is good enough. And then you just buy, 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 buy. One day the low will be in and you would have bought that and that's gonna all this is gonna juice up your future returns so if you just bought uh, a take here for example I mean this was a long downtrend if you just increasingly bought if if you upped your buying the lower and longer it went your long term res long term results would get juiced up big time if you bought a lot here, after it had gone down for a long time to low levels, then a fat uptrend was just around the corner. And what happened after this flush, uh, fat uptrend, uh, 
again, that, that's your best defense. Buying low is your best offense and defense. Because it's pretty much impossible right now to be overpaying for miners. And at the same time, the future expected returns are the highest. So it's both almost foolproof and you have the best future returns. I mean, think about it. I mean, it's just, it's so extreme common sense. Still, if you look at Twitter or whatever, almost nobody will agree with this. They can't figure out how anyone could be buying a sector that has done this poorly in the past. Meanwhile, the biggest returns always comes after the peak of shittiness. That's just how it is. So it's like common sense. But, but again, it's like 95% doesn't beat an index. So almost every, every opinion you'll hear out there, uh, including from people smarter than you, or who, who knows a lot more about macro or whatever. I mean, I think <laughs> this strategy is so foolproof. Just knowing that the market goes up and down. <laughs> Excuse me. You know, on the topic of uh, volatility or that marks go up and down, this is the fine silver. Down 96%, up 2,200%, down 91%, up 1,800%. How much timing do you need in, in such a volatile sector? If you just somewhat bought the low and you could be off by like, I don't know, 70%, 50% at least, any time. And again, as always, if you just bought more and more the lower it went, your, your future returns just went up. And given, again, how the compounding is affected by, you know, longer and later, this buy is better than this buy. This buy is better than this buy. Because it's later, same levels, but it's later. This would have returned, let's say, 800% in like... A year. This might have returned 800% in two years. That's a 100% time difference. Both are superb results. But this is, uh, you know, from a compounding perspective, a lot better. But this was still great. So again, it's like, it's just a, right now it's just a, uh, you know, the question is just how good can, how, how much better can the buys get? Because one day the bottom will be in and then the buys get worse, you know, in, in some sense. Uh, at least from a you know, expected value standpoint or expected return standpoint. Uh, it's like uh, I've been reading, I've been reading quite a few books lately. Uh, that's at least productive, more productive than guessing where gold and silver is going in the short term or... Uh, looking at the stock tickers every day because the market is absolutely not rational right now in the junior sector. Uh, oh, right. Okay, I forgot. Th this is one, a chart I made. Uh, it's, it's simply the silver price divided by SILJ, which is a silver miners index pretty much, divided by Bear Creek Mining. So it's like, what, what does this ratio mean? Uh, well, uh, it's a bit complex, I guess, but the point was to show just how uh, undervalued uh, juniors were, uh, underperformance relative to silver and relative to uh, larger uh, silver <laughs> producers, let's say. And you can look at this. I mean, it's kind of fascinating. I've just drawn a few horizontal lines here. It's like, okay, when it hits th uh, this point, let's say, then, you know, juniors could be considered... Oh, uh, no, no, I mean, when it hits uh, this point, it, it <laughs> uh, could, you know, mean that juniors like Bear Creek Mining are a bit stretched, that they're a bit overvalued. Uh, worked out pretty well here, worked out well here, uh, worked out well here. I mean, it basically hit at least every top, so that's great. And then we look at undervaluation when Bear Creek Mining ha has underperformed and, you know, our, our return to the mean is coming, let's say. So here it touched... Uh, uh, this briefly, yep, that was a pretty good buy. Touched here briefly, pretty good buy. Uh, 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 yeah, touched here, um, sell, red line, green line, uh, both these bottoms. 
but what you see in here is yes, they were oversold, uh, but then the junior sector totally got dislocated. You know, I call this a blowout. So even those were good buys, and in hindsight, again, those would have, uh, th if you just held long enough, these buys here would give you a very good return because this was around what 1.25, it hit 3.5, so that's like 200%. At least so great buys great buys according to this uh, if you just used uh, this you know indicator here but it first went down like 60 70 percent but if you just held off or held on you would have gotten 200 percent returns but as this uh, ratio here blew out with the uh, you know major bear market bottom in 2015-16 uh, if all you did was to buy more, your, your returns would be even better. So not a mistake to buy here, but increasingly good to just keep on buying. And then all of a sudden we had the best you know, quarter rally in miners in all, all time pretty much. Then this ratio went down here, again sell, sell signal here, proved to be pretty accurate. Hit the green, <laughs> buy, hit the green again, buy, nice. Uh, blew out again during the COVID crash. Uh, buy again, <coughs> excuse me, buy again, I, I mean, this was a superb buy, I mean, it's just a, just a few months later, and you would be up, you know, two, three hundred percent, hit the red line, so, you know, one could say sell, here it hit green again, so buy signal, buy signal, but like 2015-16, I, I didn't mark these arrows out here, like, like 2015-16, uh, uh, when it started to buy here and yeah okay buy here as well but then it blew out so instead of turning up like they used to uh, it, it, it they just kept on going so I mean I, I think this is actually a good ratio to show just how depressed I mean w basically when fundamentals start uh, to not matter that, that uh, the, the sentiment is so poor that nobody cares. No capital is going in. So this is like capitulation blowout of the juniors. Uh, so this was a, even a bit higher than it is now. And this was, ob I mean, this top here marked the best return in the last 10 years. Best return in the last 10 years. We, we have almost reached that. We're already passed the 2020 bottom so it's like again what does history say what does you know uh us knowing that the sentiment will uh, market will go up and down the sentiment always changes and the mining sector is not going away this just means that uh, right now the buys are going exponential as uh, the market uh, is totally dislocated on the downside on the cheap side and again, in two, uh, or as always in 2011, they were dislocated to the upside. They were even dislocated here. So in my opinion, if one just increasingly buys these blowouts here, you know, when the uh, pessimism is through the roof and, you know, perhaps just waiting until, you know, this ratio here, for example, hits red line, I think you're going to make a lot of money. Again, like I said, I mean, uh, uh, it, despite being down overall in my portfolio, uh, I, I think it's like I, I could probably retire uh, at the next sentiment high if I wanted to. I don't plan to do it, but it's like, yeah, so the, if, if the mining sector does not go away and my average or my median junior performs like the typical median junior does, just waiting for the next sentiment high and, and pretty much you know I could retire so so basically I'm betting that this time is not different I'm betting that the market will do what the market will always do and if that is the case this market sector will one day get uh, overvalued and expensive again and at that point in time the things that I bought now increasingly been buying and will increasingly buy the cheaper they get, they will be trading at many multiples of what they're doing now, and thus my portfolio will be worth multiples of what it is now. That is the most simple, brain-dead, common-sense strategy I can come up with.
So I again, I know exactly uh, what the right thing to do as this sector gets cheaper and cheaper and it goes down for longer and longer. Because every buy, the compounding of potential of those buys just go exponential. Uh, and again, what's past is past and can't be undone. It has led to the circumstance, circumstances we now face. All we can do is recognize our circumstances for what they are and make the best decisions we can given the givens. Again, doesn't matter... Uh, where we've been, this doesn't matter at all. All we can do is we can sell all miners or buy all miners or sell every miner we own and buy a bunch of other miners. Doesn't matter. The past doesn't matter. It's where we are right now. Buying, uh, selling low doesn't make buying high any better. This is, I mean, if you started buying here and we're here now, uh, if you can't come up with a sector that is more undervalued than now, the way you're going to make back or, you know, recoup your losses, whatever, it's simply stick it out. Preferably buy more, in my opinion. Uh, one interesting short, high yield bonds uh, versus, uh, yeah, uh, high yield bonds ETF, uh, HYG, is the blue line here. No, no, uh, it's the candlestick short here. Here you have, uh, I don't remember what happened. I think this was when, yeah, Fed started to raise rate for the first time. But you saw a sell-off in junk bonds. And wouldn't you know it, that coincided with the bottom in the juniors. Uh, 2019, I don't actually remember what happened there, uh, really. But you see, I mean, this, uh, well, cascade selling. When that stopped, marked the miners' bottom. Uh, 2020, COVID flash crash all, almost reached 2008 levels. Yep, when that that blowout in in <coughs> junk bonds, when that was over, marked the <coughs> marked the bottom, and now we're here. Uh, so we're almost down to the 2020 levels. Uh, we're not too far off from 2008 levels. And and again, it's like. Uh, this sector can get cheaper, but it doesn't matter. Just the buys just get better and better. So again, if 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 we're here right now, now let's say actually let's say we're here. The this is still a great buy, as we you know, uh, look at the blue line. I mean, you you've made a ton of money in three years. It's just that every additional buy, if you could buy even more the lower it went, uh, just, you know, juiced up your portfolio returns even more. Uh, this is an interesting thing, I think. Uh, net worth of Warren Buffett. I mean, we know, know today, okay, he's worth 58.5 billion. And that's like, you know, returns one couldn't really dream of or, or being that rich. But it's still fascinating to just look at it. It's like, yeah, started out with $5,000 when he was 14. And of course, we don't typically have the luxury of going back in time and, and starting uh, and being a Warren Buffett type investor at that age with $5,000. But I mean, when you look at it, you can see a compounding works. I mean, it's, it's at the end, it, it dwarfs, dwarfs everything else. Uh, despite the fact that the percentage changes might be the same. So it's like time is our friend, obviously. And I would bet that a lot of people, I mean, this is like outrageously good, <laughs> obviously. But it's like just to show how impressive time and a steady return is, I calculated what the compounded annual growth rate is for this performance. And that's 26.6%. So basically what this chart is showing is a portfolio that doubled every three years. Which is akin to 26.6% per year. Which again, and I talked about this before, it's like when we're out there thinking that, and I, well, I mean, especially new investors, I say, uh, would say thanks to this that we need these extremely low probability 10 baggers meaning pre-discovery place and betting it all on some drill results first of all 
even if a discovery is made, no stock <laughs> stock goes up to 1000% the next day. So that's like a fallacy from the get-go. And that's why I don't really play around in pre-discovery plays really anymore. Typically not. Uh, at least there are some that are just uh, so cheap anyway. And, you know, maybe the, the context is good. But typically they go up 100%. And the, the, the actual bulk of the returns from a discovery place is after the discovery. Even if it goes up 100%. So even if you miss the first 100%, that's typically no problem. Great Bear went up like, I think, 2000% after it had popped on the discovery. So it's like way better to uh, buy post-discovery. But again... 26.6%. So, I mean, if we would, you know, if, if the typical investor, instead of just buying, you know, pre-discovery plays with a chance in hell to have a discovery that makes the stock go up 100% the, uh, the day after the discovery, if we would just lower our expectations a bit and just aim for... A, a double every three years. Theoretically, we could become as rich as Warren Buffett if we had like 69 years or whatever uh, uh, to do it. O obviously, I mean, most of us are not 14 years old, but the, the point remains. Think about it. This chart here represents 26.6% compounded annual growth rate which means the portfolio doubles on average every three years. So going back to the mining sector, do you think there might be some companies, of course we're down right now. I mean, uh, typically we're not in here fresh, but anyway, I mean, w when this turns up, it's not gonna just do 100%. But let's pretend that we had no money invested. Uh, you just found the sector right now, but you knew enough about the sector or to judge companies. Do you think you could spot a few companies that you have a high probability to go up 100% if you get three years? Yeah, I think so. So it's like we, we don't need 10 baggers. If we can compound 26 per year. Theoretically, we will get as rich as Warren Buffett, but nobody is after those stories typically. M my goal is 50% per year un until it's you know becomes unsustainable because you have too much money. Uh, but I think the point stands. Another interesting thing is like LBMA has announced moves to support artis artisanal gold miners with steps shared by miners. I mean. Okay, they're trying to, what it looks like, uh, trying to bring in gold and support uh, artisanal miners. I mean, we know the, we know the, the capex in this sector is, I mean, near decades low. I mean, money spent on exploration and stuff like that. Uh, we know that the se junior sector is absolutely atrocious right now and the miners overall, <laughs> overall there's no money for them. Uh, some juniors are, you know, winding down operations, sitting on their hands, etc. What a, does that do to supply? I mean, it, it doesn't boost supply. And supply is apparently the issue. I mean, comics is getting drained both on silver and gold. And now LBMA is out there saying they're going to, you know, try to work with artisanal gold miners. I don't think they're doing it for, you know, altruistic reasons. I think they're doing it because they need more gold. Which, again, if that's the case, what is happening, I mean, fundamentally, uh, supply-demand-wise with junior miners? Their value is going up, but price is obviously going down. Makes the buys even better. Comic Silver, still getting drained. It just surpassed, uh, it went below 40 million ounces. A uh, level not seen since 2017. You, uh, again, it's like you can put whatever price you want on something as long as you have inventory but it, comics can't bleed it's like i mean i think there was like one million ounces withdrawn yesterday or something i mean when you at face value 
if that rate would continue, comics registered category would be empty in 30 days. One month. I'm, not, I'm absolutely not saying that's going to happen. I'm just saying it appears that this market is not balanced at today's silver prices, paper silver prices. But they can set whatever price they want as long as they have inventory to sell. Uh, yeah, this is what I talked about earlier. This is from Crescat. Commodity producers capex cycle adjuster for GDP. We're way under investing. W what is that? Uh, how, how does that affect? I mean, an increasing demand picture with a decreasing supply picture. It's a very good tailwind to have. I want to own gold, silver. Hard commodities, hard assets, because everything is being underspent, and there's going to be a sh there's going to be shortages because we have underinvested. Uh, show that uh, this is a bit outdated, I think, but it's like short one hundred years of commodity valuation. No brainer, absolute no brainer. It's like the big picture. I expect to be. I don't know when the actual top will be you know the the big top you know a top like this this or this or this but it might be six years from now so it's like uh, knowing that again it's like what happens uh, when they get severely undervalued i mean this was a rally this was pretty fit, fat rally obviously you know in a few years and that didn't even reach these levels but this level here i mean you can see again reversion to the mean reversion to the mean reversion to the mean Uh, 42 million years of salary wiped out by US, uh, US Treasury losses. Uh, just to put things in perspective, uh, everybody's hurting right now. If you're in, if you're in miners and you think that's a big problem, that you're, you have big paper losses right now, everybody has paper losses. And, and mo most of the ones who have paper losses have paper losses because they own something overvalued. Not because they owned something that was already dirt cheap that went cheaper. If you own Tesla at the top, at a you know P of five hundred, and that gets cut in half, reversion to the mean does not mean that it will go back up. Reversion to the mean means that it will go should go even lower and stay lower because it's so overvalued or probably so overvalued. Uh, there's a big difference between being down fifty percent. Uh, in something overvalued or was overvalued or being down something uh, down 50 percent in something uh, that was already undervalued again it's like okay uh, this is uh, yeah let's say you bought here S reversion to the mean or to the next sentiment swing at least uh, you made money uh, this was a much better buy, even though you were down 50% than buying this and see it go down 50%. Because it might still be overvalued here. But if it went down here, it just became no-brainer cheap instead. Uh, some other stuff. I mean, again, it's like some books I, I bought. Uh, uh, again, that's more productive than watching tickers every day i haven't watched that as well the market isn't even open yet <laughs> uh i don't remember i saw this on twitter i don't know what book it is from uh, oh it's uh graham so it's probably from you know the intelligent investor or something graham advises you never to have more than 75 percent of your total assets in stock but is putting all your money into the stock market inadvisable for everyone for a time minority of investors a 100 percent stock portfolio may make sense you are one of them if you have set aside enough cash to support your family for at least one year will be investing steady for at least 20 years to come survived the bear market that began in 2000 did not sell stocks during the bear market that began in 2000, bought more stocks during the bear market that began in 2000, and have read chapter 8 in this book. I mean, my, my folks would be here, it's like, again, three points talking about, okay, surviving, uh, not selling, and buying more in a bear market. 
which basically is, I mean, akin to now. It's like if if you're if you're in, in my opinion, and and the the point of the authors, if you're buying juniors, the cheaper they go, that tells you that you know what you're doing. The cheaper they become, and you anything you buy more of it, the cheaper it becomes. Means that you have common sense and are doing uh, it the right way. Uh, this is a one uh, slide I really like uh, from, or slide, a page from uh, Howard Marks, The Most Important Thing. Uh, Thus, bargains are often created when investors either fail to consider an asset fairly or yada yada yada. Uh, Seth Klarman, generally the greater stigma or revulsion, the better the bargain. I don't know much that is uh, more repulsing than minus right now, but this is the, uh, these two these two points are the kickers here, I think. Usually its, pri usually its price has been falling, making the first level thinker, meaning dumbass or meaning 95% of people, who would want to own that? H have you heard someone say that about miners lately? Who would want to own that? Why would anybody be buying miners? I, I see that every day on Twitter nowadays. It bears repeating that most investors extrapolate past performance, expecting the continuation of trends rather than the form more dependable regression to the mean. Meaning that 95% of people will not be buying down here because they always expect it to go e lower and lower. And you know, my example here is that people aren't 95% of people are not buying this because they expect it to just continue forever, forever. And that's why they buy at the tops because they think that, hey, this is going to continue forever. So that what that means. Uh, instead of like me, Banking on the fact that markets will always go up and down. Reversion to the mean. Uh, first level thinkers tend to view past price weakness as worrisome. How often do you see that on Twitter? People talking about the risks of owning miners is going up. That you should be worried because they, they, have, gone, they have gone down. So you should be worried because they can go lower. It's like... Jesus Christ. I mean, we get bombarded by crap advice all the time. Not as a sign that the asset has gotten cheaper, which happens to be the case. As a result, a bargain asset tends to be the one that's highly unpopular. Capital stays away, check, from it or flees, check, and no one can think of a reason to own it, check. We... We should not be surprised that when the buys that we're putting in at these extremes, when they, if we hold on long enough and they show a big profit, we should not be surprised. Because that has happened every time in history. There's no mystery in, in buying uh, cheap and making money. Those two go together. Uh, another one here, as people, uh, th this is the opposite, you know, uh, bull market stuff, as people, or bubble, as people ra raise their opinion of it, they increasingly want to own it. That makes capital flow to it and the prices rises. People take the rising price as a sign of the investment's merit. And right now they're uh, doing the opposite as they see price decline. They think you shouldn't invest in it. So they buy still more. Others hear about it for the first time and join in. And the upward trend, make, uh, trend takes on the appearance of an unstoppable virtuous cycle. It's mostly a popularity contest <coughs> in which the asset in question is the winner. I mean, basically, when we think about what, it, what is it that we're front running? 95% of people follow trends. More people are buying up here because they've seen this trend. <laughs> Here is when most people bought in because they saw this trend. So if you're buying in a downtrend, late in a downtrend, you're front running, well, first of all, uh, the bottom, whenever, when, uh, whenever and at what level that will happen. And then you have, it's like this, yeah, this was starting to be a trend. I mean, you can see how quickly it responded. I mean, it just went straight up, basically. That's how I think, I mean... How, how few sellers there were really even here or how let's say how undervalued uh, they might have been here already but it's like 
it's we're front running a bottom that we don't know when it's going to happen then it's going to be a reluctant climb probably unless it goes straight up like here uh, but it, the longer <laughs> the trend is up so the first bounce i mean lo not a lot of people will look at that as a trend they just see okay dead cat bounce dead cat bounce uh here probably is where people might start looking into it but they might think yeah okay I don't know, probably gonna, you know, be a, just a lower, lower, whatever. But it, when the trend has been in place for quite some time, then people are gonna be uh, convinced that it's a bull market. And the closer we get to selling, the more people are gonna want to buy because they think that the invest investment is getting better and better because price goes up. Meaning that it's the opportunity is getting worse and worse, but that's not how people look at it. That's not how people at all look at it. So it's like right now, I mean, if there's okay, this was a pretty good one. Uh, uh, let's skip that. Okay, if there's one thing I want to leave you with is that cyclical sectors go up and down a lot. And knowing this means that there will forever be a top and forever a bottom. No trend lasts forever. And knowing that means that any additional day in an uptrend gets, gets us one day closer to the start of the next big downtrend. And every extra day of a downtrend gets us one day closer to the bottom and the start of the next major uptrend. That's one thing. But just knowing if something is cheap is good enough. Right now they are extremely cheap. They are, we are very late. I mean this downtrend has already persisted for quite some time. And this is not, I mean here, this started off being extremely overvalued. <laughs> the juniors weren't really very overvalued here I mean they, they were somewhat but it's like uh, n not by a huge margin uh, so I, I don't I really don't care what gold and silver is doing right now some believe gold will go to 1500 I don't care I look at what I'm paying for these juniors I know that I'm going to make money on the buys I'm doing today if gold goes down I expect to still make money on the buys I did today. And if juniors go cheaper, uh, get cheaper, I just think I'll make even more money on any additional buy. And I'll make more and more money the lower and later the trend continues. Or lower and longer the trend continues. Because each day gets us one day closer to the actual best buy the bottom and is getting uh, higher returns and closer to the next sentiment high I mean that's pretty much it it's like okay if we know we're gonna hit that it means okay every additional bias goes exponentially better exponentially better exponentially better that's what's happening right now because this sector is going to bottom one day and the cheaper we can buy it, uh, the higher the returns will be on those purchases and the closer we are to the next uptrend. It, it doesn't matter when the actual you know, next sentiment high comes. We know by definition we're getting closer and closer to it. Uh, long rant, uh, big dose of copium. Again, I hope this makes a lot of sense. And that, I mean, if you, if you truly understand uh, how cyclical sectors work and uh, markets overall, overall work, uh, you should become very comfortable and peaceful given what's going on. Because you pretty much already know that you're doing the most intelligent thing. You know you're not making mistakes. You know, based on the history of markets and uh, hu and human psychology, 
and price to value, you know you're not making a mistake. It's just a matter of when and how much money we're going to make. And again, the caveat is don't buy absolute crap, etc. And like we saw from Warren Buffett's portfolio, he averaged 26%. You don't need in 100% uh, every three years. So you don't need to go in to every super high risk stock because you think you need 1000% in the next years, in the next year. Uh, keep that in mind. Warren Buffett averaged a double every three years and he became, you know, one of the richest men, men in the world. We're not making a mistake. This is right now the, the, where is that slide? The, the junior sector is totally dislocated. Uh, yeah, every, everybody's getting, getting flushed out pretty much. Uh, so we're 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 close to an extreme. I don't know if if we're, I don't know if we're here, 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 here. We just know this is gonna bottom one day. So it might look like this, might look like this, might look like this, might look like this. Whatever, this is gonna turn one day. And when it does, the ones who are on board are gonna make a lot of money. To quote Bob Moriarty, if you get one of these right, you can pretty much retire. Thanks for listening. Uh, don't uh, consider this investing advice. Uh, make up your own opinions. Uh, yeah. Thanks for listening. Bye.